recording. I didn't. I was going to say, I didn't hear a recording thing yet. So, um, all right. I, I looked this meeting scheduled for an hour and a half. I'm pretty sure I don't have that much information. Um, but I'll give you what I have and then you can go enjoy the, the rest of the afternoon. I'm hoping it's nice by you because it's really nice by me. Um, my name is Dr. Michael Hennis. I actually recognize some of you from the last one of these we did. And um, I saw a face that looked familiar from the conference too. So I'm, I'm hoping this is kind of that, that group. Um, like I said, I'm Dr. Michael Hennis and we're talking about um, vagus nerve and how it relates to brain injury recovery. And why are we talking about it? Well, we're talking about it because it's all over the internet. It's all over the common research. It's all over, um, it's all over the place. It's on blogs. It's in, in, in commonplace talk. And a lot, one of the questions I get a lot is what is the vagus nerve? What is vagus nerve stim and why is it helpful? Um, so that's kind of why we're, we're talking about it today. And I'm actually doing this same thing tomorrow night in a Facebook group that I run. Um, I've given this talk before, but this is my highest number of attendees that have said they're coming. So this must be a, must still be a pretty good topic. Um, who am I? Like I said, I'm Dr. Michael Hennis. I am a chiropractic neurologist. So what does that mean? That means I went to chiropractic school. And after that, I spent way too much time looking at textbooks and learning about brains and how to rehab them. Okay. Um, so the main difference between me and a medical neurologist is the medical neurologist wants to find a stroke, a tumor, a neurotransmitter imbalance, something that they can see on an image or a blood test or some hard physical lesion and what we're going to do about that. My job is to equate the physical medicine to that rehab. What can I do? What kind of exercises can I give you? I'm kind of a blend of physical therapy and vision therapy and chiropractic and all of this stuff together. Um, me and my business partner, we would run an office in Bloomington, Minnesota, right south end of our metro area, actually in the chiropractic college called the Neural Connection. And we do neurological rehab all day long, every day. That's what we do. Um, we don't do much for pure chiropractic work, if you want to put it that way. Um, and both of us, we've been doing that for just under 10 years. I think Eric got nine and a half and I'm at about nine and a third. So we're, we're right at that right at the part where uh, uh, we're really supposed to know what we're talking about at this point. So we've, we've got some time under our belts, um, but that's enough about me. Let's, let's get into it here, okay? We are talking about the brain. That's really what we're after today is the brain. And we're going to use the vagus nerve as kind of a, oh, a highway to get in there. And, um, but really what we're after is making our brains work better, right? This is um, the brain injury network. We're talking about brain injuries and it doesn't really matter where that brain injury came from, whether it was traumatic, whether it was acquired, whether it was congenital, whether it was ischemic, none of that really matters when we're talking about rehab. The underlying processes are mostly the same, right? If we have a traumatic injury, we're gonna have higher inflammatory cascades in the get-go. But once we get into the longer term, aspects of care, um, a lot of those processes are, are quite similar, okay? So regardless of the variety of brain injury we're talking about, this stuff will apply. It might have varying degrees of effectiveness, um, but it'll still, still work. A um, couple disclaimers before I go any further. I do have some links in here that offer free consults. This is a seminar that I give in a Facebook group that I run. Um, do not feel obligated to call me or anything like that for appointments, but if you want to, it's there. Um, I talk about some lasers and I talk about some vagus nerve stimulation devices. I do have a relationship with a laser company. Eric and I speak for them. And the one of the links for the vagus nerve stim device is an affiliate link. So if you use it and you do buy a device, I do get paid from that. You are not obligated to do that. I recommend the device anyway. I decided I should, you know, just get paid for a little bit if I'm selling all their stuff for them. So those are there. You are not obligated to buy them, but they are there if it's something that that interests you. Okay. So back to this now. Brain injuries are confusing. They cause anxiety. They make you feel alone, like you're sailing into a storm, especially if it was something you didn't see coming. And Last I checked, nobody sees a brain injury coming, right? Whether it's you, whether it's a family member, 
or someone that you're just acquainted with, right? These things are, they, they turn your world upside down, even if it wasn't you that was, that was injured, okay? You tend to feel alone. You have a sensation of something's wrong, even if you're not necessarily feeling it just yet. Um, a lot of my practice revolves around concussions and um, kind of the, the high school population. And a lot of times these kids come in about a week after their injury and they say, doc, I feel great, but something's off. I just don't know what it is and they're not truly symptomatic yet. Uh, so you kind of have this, um, the feeling of impending doom, you know, it's, it's usually not quite that bad, but something's just not right. Um, they tend to cause anxiety because they are the unknown and we don't know what's, what in particular is, is coming down the pike, so to speak. Okay. They keep you on edge. And the reason I'm kind of explaining it this way is this is what underactivity of the vagus nerve kind of causes. Vagus nerve is a big parasympathetic portion of our nervous system. And it essentially keeps us calm, right? It keeps our autonomic part of our nervous system working well. So if we're not seeing good vagus nerve tone or it's not working as well, you'll start to have sensations of inner trembling or anxiety or just being on edge or jumpy, that sort of thing, okay? So obviously that's not what we want to happen. What do we really want? We want this to be smooth sailing, right? Smooth seas. There's some clouds in the sky, but they don't look scary. I don't know about you, this looks peaceful and I'm not even much for, you know, I don't want to live on a lake or anything like that. And that's too much upkeep and just stuff that goes along with it. But, you know, a good day on a boat's always a, always a good time. Uh, you want to be, you want to be calm. You want to be peaceful. You want to have this network of support around you. You don't want to feel alone. You want to be stoic in a sense where it's okay to be afraid of what just happened or the unknown, but not letting that influence your decisions so that yes, it's a little bit scary, but you need to keep yourself moving forwards. Okay. You want to feel like you're in control, even if you're having a bad day. Okay. And really Vegas nerve can really be an avenue to give you some of that control back. Um, so what are we talking about here? Uh, we're talking about brain. We're talking about brain stem. Um, so brain actually lives right around here, right up on top of the thalamus. In school, we were taught to call this Mr. Microphone because that's just kind of what it looks like as a microphone on a stand. And then right down at the bottom here, we've got the spinal cord. So brain stem is our link uh, between the brain and the spinal cord. And then we see all of these little nerves poking off here. And if the nerve originates within the skull, and actually pokes through a hole in the skull, that's what we call a cranial nerve. With one exception, there's one down here called the accessory nerve. You'll notice it actually starts in the spinal cord and goes back into the skull. That one's a cheater. Um, and it is actually a spinal nerve, but uh, we didn't know that when we discovered them hundreds of years ago and we just decided to leave it, leave it as a cranial nerve because we all learned this 12 and it's, it's easier to do it that way. Specifically, we're talking about this kind of big guy right, right up in there, and we'll see this a little bit better, but we're talking about the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10. Unique thing about cranial nerves is we name them by Roman numerals instead of numbers. Um, I never really understood why, but it really does, if someone's lazy in writing their notes, it, it's a lot easier to tell which one you're talking about. Um, it comes out, it's this big honking thing right at the bottom of your brain stem, comes out of the medulla and it wanders all over the place, okay? Pretty big guy, and it, it has innervation of lots of different things. Specifically, uh, vagus nerve is a peripheral nerve. What does that mean? If I jump backwards a slide here again, anything that comes out of the brain, the brain stem, or if you can imagine the spinal cord coming down, those three structures are considered our central nervous system. Anything outside of that is a peripheral nerve, right? So. We've left the brain stem. We've got nuclei in here that the nerves originate on or send their information to. But once we leave there, we're in the peripheral nerve system. And that's um, probably doesn't matter so much for here today. It's really important when studying and understanding uh, how the communication between those nerves work. Um, but here, I guess it's a little bit more on the, on the trivial side of things. We talked about how the vagus nerve is a cranial nerve. And it's named for its vagrant or vagabond kind of structure. It leaves the brainstem, travels through your neck, and then it goes everywhere. It's all over the place. If you're going through and studying anatomy, anything between the top of your rib cage to the bottom of your pelvis or the top of your pelvis, pretty much all of that, you can find the vagus nerve in there somewhere. 
Um, and they just, they saw it everywhere and there's branches and all of that stuff. So they, they named it Vegas because it's, it's just kind of wanders around everywhere inside of you. Okay. It's a major component of the parasympathetic nervous system. And that's really where it becomes therapeutic and how we can use it. So that's something that we focus on a lot of the time. Um, and in the common circles, if your digestion is bad, if you have some runny stools or you're constipated or you're stressed out, we like to talk about how the vagus nerve sends information down, right? Top down from the head down to calm everything down, make your guts work, give you better digestion, get your bowels moving, all of that fun stuff that hopefully you never have to think about. Uh, and that's what the vagus nerve does, but it's bi-directional. So just as much as it sends information down, even more so, it carries information back up to tell your brain what's happening in all of your guts, okay? So just as important as the information going out, even more so is the information coming back up. Um, there's some anecdotal evidence, early research to suggest that things like Parkinson's start in the gut and that it travels up the vagus nerve. Not the greatest evidence in the world, but that's kind of the theory is that information travels both ways. Parkinson's has all kinds of different mechanisms from neurodegeneration to autoimmune to inflammation. So um, just a theory at this point, but that one's been around for a little while if you've ever heard that. So vagus nerve, what does it have its little fingers in? Everything on that page there um, has some branch or innervation of vagus nerve. So we have tear ducts, we have uh, salivation, our heart rate, our, our, our lungs have some innervation there. Most of our abdominal organs, um, basically if, if it's something you don't think about, chances are your vagus nerve has some consequence with it, okay? Uh, another side note, I'm over caffeinated this morning and I get really excited. So if you need me to slow down, please tell me because otherwise I will talk 10,000 miles an hour. I do it every single time. All right, so it innervates most of the muscles of the pharynx and the larynx. So anything behind your nose and mouth and then getting down into your voice box uh, is mostly vagus nerve. There's some other branches that come in there. Everything, um, there's a lot of crisscrossing when you're when you're being formed in the womb as an embryo. Uh, so everything up there gets pretty complicated, but mostly vagus nerve. It causes parasympathetic. Um, that's just how we denote that PU with a little sigma there to the heart, thus reducing heart rate. And this is a great, um, I don't have it here, a great way to measure this is heart rate variability. Okay, that's a marker that we see. Um, if you have an eye watch, chances are it's measure, measuring your heart rate variability. Fitbits, most wearables are measuring this stuff now. Um, we're starting to see it commercially where I can do it in the clinic, although wearables are still kind of the most useful way because it tracks it continuously. Um, but in the office, I can stick a pulse oximeter on someone. And if we want to demonstrate the vagus nerve working or not, is you can actually press right in here on the neck on this carotid body, and that will stimulate some vagus nerve um, afferents, so up to the brain, and the efferent information down. So we send information up to stimulate that vagus nerve, and then we send it back down, and we can watch your heart rate decrease. Okay? That means that reflex is working. And based on how long that takes to rebound or stop working, or maybe it works backwards and it raises your heart rate, then we know we have a problem with that loop somewhere along the way. Okay? Regulates smooth muscle, contraction in the gut, glandular secretion. So this is where you're going to see things like digestion have problems, or you're going to have constipation, you're going to have some runny stools, you get a lot of acid reflux, usually because you don't have enough stomach acid. There we go. You don't have enough stomach acid or you're not releasing enough pancreatic enzymes or your gut can't move food through appropriately. So you have this, this um, gastroparesis that can be um, vagus nerve, nerve stimulated. Someone asked me a question. I don't know if it was from this group or my Facebook group, but esophageal achalasia, which means your, your esophagus is essentially paralyzed. So when you swallow it, it's just a dead drop and you're not moving things through. Um, vagus nerve is is implicated in that, but the interesting part is we don't really know why. We don't know if it's autoimmune, we don't know if it's trauma related, um, we don't know if it's vital related. And the research from what I was able to do briefly this morning suggests that it's probably all of the above, which is never a fun answer either. But 
Um, sensory neuron of the gut, liver, and pancreas. So just as much as it's important to send information down to make all of this stuff work, we also have to send information back up so that our brain knows what's happening. Did we actually move that food through our guts? Are we digesting it? Are we creating enough stomach acid? Do we not have enough? All of those, those things. Um, and it's also an anti-inflammatory mediator. So um, inflammation is, is kind of the name of the game in almost anything that's happening uh, in the body. And inflammation is not a bad thing. We need inflammation to increase, to get our immune system to start to pay attention to things, to start to repair things, to attack the things that don't belong. But when inflammation gets out of control, right, we have a brain injury and that metabolic cascade is never dealt with, uh, the immune system starts to go a little crazy. It actually gets depressed, stops paying attention to what it's attacking and starts to attack everything. That's a long-term change, but the vagus nerve is a great avenue to decrease some of that without jumping into too much of the physiology, supplemental things, medications, drugs, um, changing the environment, all of that stuff uh, can be a little bit tedious. Vagus nerve is very easy to, to add something in into that, that paradigm to reduce inflammation. So what does this look like? Okay, we have all of the anatomy, everything that we talked about earlier that gets innervated by the vagus nerve. And we've got information that comes down from the brain. So our brain is telling our body to do things, secretion of gastric enzymes, um, releasing enzymes, releasing stomach acid, moving our guts, all of that stuff. But that only accounts for about 10% of the use of the vagus nerve, right? And most people I talk to think vagus nerve mostly sends information out. And it's an important piece of its job. But 90% of those fibers are actually dedicated to sending information from our guts, from our body, and sending it back up to our brain. So really, it relies on, our brain relies on our body to tell what's going on. How much inflammation is there? Are you hungry? Are you full? Are you using energy appropriately? Are you producing enough? Do we need to digest more? Do we have to get into that rest and digest phase to get more energy? All of those, those sorts of things. But this also complicates things. What if the vagus nerve is working perfectly, but our brain isn't able to calculate that information well? So now we suddenly jump from, well, let's stimulate the vagus nerve and see what's happening to, is the brain ready to receive that information? And that's kind of my job to figure out in rehab is, is the reflex intact? And if it is intact, why isn't our brain using that information appropriately? So we go from a peripheral problem, is the problem in my hand? Or is the problem in the part of my brain that represents my hand? Same sort of thing here. Is the problem actually in my guts? Or is my brain just not sure what's going on in my guts because it can't process that information, okay? What's interesting is vagus nerve is actually fairly deep, very, very well protected. So it's pretty difficult to actually damage a vagus nerve. Um, that's not to say we don't have um, issues and things like stroke or traumatic injury where the brain stem is involved. We can certainly have some problems in vagus nerve at that point. Um, but most of the time, the nerve itself is intact. So it's usually something um, actually in the brain that becomes, becomes part of the problem. Okay. So how does this really work? Well, TBI recovery, and I should really have that as brain injury recovery because it doesn't matter if it's a TBI or not. Um, honestly, that's just a typo on my part. TBI rolls off my tongue a little bit better. Um, but it's all about three things. It's about fuel. Do you have the energy in your system that you need before you need it, right? You don't leave for a road trip with an empty tank. You're not going to get very far. You have to have that gasoline in your car before you leave or you're gonna make it to the end of your driveway and say, cool, we're having a staycation guys, right? Not, not usually what you're after, okay? Oxygen, okay? Oxygen, if we loop this into vagus nerve, well, vagus nerve controls our lungs, right? It innervates our lungs, it controls surfactant production, it controls um, vasodilation of our blood vessels and our ability to get oxygen to our different tissues. So we have consequences there. So if we don't have good energy and we're not delivering oxygen, those neurons are really starving and can't do their job very well. Okay. And the last thing is activation and plasticity. Is the part of the brain receiving this information? Once it gets that information, is it healthy enough to process it, 
And then can it integrate the information coming from the vagus nerve with the rest of the information coming from our body? Our brain's entire job is to tell us where we are in space and how to interact with the world around us, right? We've got three major senses that do that, um, that we can talk about at another time. But if we're not able to process the information coming from our guts, coming from our digestive tract, coming from our lungs, telling us what our heart rate is, it's really hard for our brain to send, uh, to keep us upright and, and, and moving around in the world, right? Perfect example of this. Postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome or postural orthostatic hypotension. You stand up and your heart rate spikes and your blood pressure drops. Well, where did that miscommunication break down? Because your brain knew you were going to move. So why was your vagus nerve not communicating that movement appropriately and stimulating your heart and your blood vessels to constrict and send blood where you needed to? So now you stood up and all your blood is in your feet and not in your brain making you dizzy. Okay. That's a consequence of vagus nerve and why we have to look at this in, in brain injury rehab, okay? Now, this is a rat study, right? We'll just be aware of that. Um, a lot of neurology research ends up getting done in animals because it's a lot easier to give them brain injuries and not be sued and lose your license. Um, most of the research we have in humans is um, after injury research, somebody that's been injured already, and then we look and see what kind of deficit they have. Um, because that's just the, the way we, we can do it, right? Uh, so a lot of this will come out of rats. If you really spend money on your study, you'll see this in monkeys. Um, but that's, that's a lot harder and they're bigger and more expensive and all of that stuff. But adding vagus nerve stimulation more than double the benefit of rehabilitative training. Okay, so that's what they saw in rats. The improvements lasted months after the end of the vagus nerve stimulation. So they did some stimulation while they were doing some stroke rehab on the rats. I believe it was stroke in this particular study. Um, and months later, they were still seeing the improvements in the rats, even though they weren't doing the vagus nerve stimulation anymore. Okay, so what did they do? They moved on to a human pilot study and chronic stroke patients. So these people have had strokes in the past. Uh, it's gotten chronic, so we're looking at at least uh, about after the year mark, and we're doing rehab still, and we're pairing vagus nerve stimulation with rehab exercises, and it actually tripled recovery compared with training without vagus nerve stimulation. So this is a super powerful thing. There is, I won't say no one, but 99% of patients that come into my office, regardless of what we're doing, if the brain is involved, we are doing vagus nerve stimulation. I do still have some friends I treat. We're doing regular chiropractic work, um, that sort of thing. I'm not going to stick them on vagus nerve stimulation, but anybody that's in for neurological rehab in my office is getting vagus nerve stimulation in some way, shape, or form. And we're going to talk about a couple of different ways that I do it, some ways that you can do it at home. Some of them involve equipment, some of them don't. Okay. Um, vagus nerve is also implicated in gut health. I'm, I'm going to touch on this briefly. And um, Carly, correct me if I'm wrong, but we actually have a, a couple of slides or the, the recording from the, from the conference earlier this, this year, right? Yes, I have the recording, yes. Okay. So yes. I talk about These this a little folks, bit more. Unless here. they attended the conference, wouldn't have access to it, but. Got it. Um, but yes, you have access to it. <laughs> got it, got it, got, got it, got it. Okay, okay. Um, we'll scratch that then. I talked about this a little Sorry. bit in March. Um, so I'm not going to go into this a, a whole lot, but um, I think I might actually bring it up later this year on, I, do, I think I'm doing two more of these with you. So you'll get it eventually. Um, but this is another rat study. And essentially what they did was they're looking at consequences of inflammation after a brain injury. And um, stomach is innervated by vagus nerve. So we know vagus nerve is implicated in this. What you're looking at is a slide of stained rat jejunum, small intestine, okay? So what they did is they knocked the rats out, they took a little chunk of their small intestines, put it on a slide, fixed it, looked at it under a microscope, and we can see just how healthy this is. We see big finger-like villi. So this is what the lining of your stomach looks like. We've got this single cell layer down here separating our, 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 our guts from our bloodstream, and everything looks pretty healthy. Everything's fat, everything is nice and glued together. And then what they did to the rats is they gave them a brain injury. They dropped a pin on their head. They cut their heads open and dropped a pin on their brain. And then six hours later, six hours, they did the exact same slide 
And you can see how much that's breaking down just from the inflammatory consequences and the brain not firing appropriately and able to, to stimulate um, good gut health. So this stuff is very important in, in brain injury recovery. Uh, gut permeability is very well studied in brain injury and many, many other conditions, specifically autoimmunity. Um, so this is something that we have to address, if not in the acute phases of, of a brain injury, um, definitely in the chronic phases, as it's just something that we, we really have to um, take into account. Otherwise, we'll start to see things go backwards, even though we're doing all of the best we have in the world. If we're not addressing things like gut health, we're going to have problems um, going on there. And I, I realize that's a, a cliffhanger, but we're, we're going to move on a little bit. So vagus nerve and anti-inflammation. Prolonged inflammation decreases immune function. And I'm trying to look ahead. I think I left this particular slide out here, um, but I alluded to it already. What we find is the longer that we're inflamed, our immune system actually um, gets decreased. It's like getting beat up constantly and it keeps trying to get up and fight the good fight for us to keep us healthy, but eventually it gets depressed, okay? And a lot of people, the, the common argument I get is, Doc, the longer I'm inflamed, all of a sudden I start to get all sorts of other conditions. I never had, um, I mean, pick your autoimmune condition. Um, I became diabetic. I can't lose weight because I suddenly have Cushing's, so my adrenals are going to garbage. I started to get MS. I started to get lupus. I have psoriasis. Autoimmune conditions are all the same. We just name them differently based on what is getting attacked, but the underlying process is, is fairly similar. Um, as the immune system gets beat down, it seems to look overactive because it quits paying attention to what it's attacking. It doesn't care if it's looking at a bacteria, if it's looking at our own cells. If there's a lot of something there, it starts to go after it, and that's not what we want. So more inflammation, we start to see interleukin-6, we see tumor necrosis factor alpha, we see production. This leads to blood-brain barrier permeability, just like, I'm going to back up a slide, this is gut. So we've got this nice tight layer of cells here and all the way through here. The blood brain barrier that keeps your brain separate from your blood supply looks very, very similar. In fact, it's actually glued together the same way, just tighter, but the same process starts to happen. We start to lose um, that separation and that permeability, and that leads to further inflammation, further activation of the immune system. And this whole thing just starts to recycle. We get more inflammation, which decreases our immune system function causing this more permeability and more dysfunction, right? Sorry, we have to go through some of the icky, nitty gritty, not so happy science before we can look at the rainbows and how, how vagus nerve stimulation can help us out here. So how does the vagus nerve lead to anti-inflammatory processes? Well, it's mediated through this hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, the stress response, the cortisol response. Um, like I told you, I'm over caffeinated today. I can feel my heart rate being elevated. I'm dealing with this, um, this personal, personal issue with the bank and it's just, it's got me on edge and I can feel it today. So I need to, um, I need to take some deep breaths is what I need to do and, and calm myself down. Um, it actually, uh, stimulates lymphocytes from, uh, to be released from the spleen, um, which inhibits some of those inflammatory cytokines. Okay. These are chemical messengers, which means they're released into our bloodstream. So if you've had uh, a mild traumatic brain injury, a concussion, and you've recovered from it, you haven't had symptoms for three years and you smack your thumb with a hammer because you're trying to remodel your deck and it hurts and your thumb swells up and gets big puffy and red and inflamed. And you start to have some neurological symptoms a couple days later. You're like, well, I sure didn't give myself a concussion by smacking my thumb. No, you didn't, but you inflamed your brain right? That inflammation is a global phenomenon. So we'll see things like that. You hit your thumb, but your knee starts to hurt, right? That's how that works because these things are chemical messengers and they go everywhere in your body, okay? Um, this actually recruits the enteric neurons, which are the, the neurons actually that surround your digestive tract. And this is actually faster than um, dampening this stress response uh, through cortisol, okay? So we start to see things that we can actually dampen macrophage activity, dampen, again, those inflammatory cytokines. So really, really cool and fast things we can do by um, activating vagus nerve, if you will. So all of that sounds great. Doc, 
how do we do it? How do we incorporate this stuff either in your home workout programs? Um, if we have providers on here, some simple ways that you can do this in your office. This is all very, most of this is very low cost. Um, and a good good portion of it is actually free. So either if you have a healthcare provider that can help you out with it, if it's something you want to do on your own, if it's something that um, you want to add to your own rehab program of your own accord. Um, so vagus nerve stimulation, that's me. And I've got um, several different methods hooked up to myself here. So these are the things that all require equipment to do, okay? Um, I've got our big fancy laser. Um, this is a, a it doesn't matter what it's called. It's a red light laser. And um, this is my favorite way to stimulate vagus nerve. This is not something you're going to be able to do in your house. It costs as much as a car. Um, so this is something that you're going to have to find an office um, to help you with. Okay. Um, low level laser therapy, a vagus nerve stimulating frequency is 10 Hertz. That means the light turns on and off 10 times a second. Um, this stuff permeates bone, it permeates brain, gets right into that brain stem and stimulates vagus nerve. It's fantastic. You don't feel a thing um, when we can just let this go. We can actually do it while we're doing other therapies, which means I can rehab and push your brain really, really hard because I'm helping you recover at the exact same time, all while reducing inflammation, all of the stuff we've already talked about. Um, you'll see I've got some clips on my ear here. Um, these are just little plastic electrode clips hooked up to a... Um, uh, muscle stimulation device, the big ones that you see in the, the corner of the offices that you normally turn on really high to get your muscles to contract. Um, do not use one of the workout ones. If you have a TENS unit at home, they are okay, but do not use the ab strengthener ones. Um, you'll give yourself a headache real fast. Um, trust me, I've tried it. Doesn't feel great. Um, but what we do is we run some, I think I have a slide in here later. Um, I can't see that far ahead. Um, if not, here, if you can see my camera, we've got a tragus right here. And then we've got this little notch right in the back of your ear. It's called your contra, your Simba contra. You can put the electrodes really anywhere on the ear and you'll activate, it's called the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. So it's, it's right in there um, to get that, that sensory portion, sending information back up to the brain, okay? With this, I actually use a very, very small voltage. We like to turn it up to one volt with our particular machine that works. Um, it actually has to do with uh, the resistance running through the tissue. And we measured our machine and we found out that one volt is right where we need to be. It makes it super simple. Um, not something I usually recommend doing yourself at home unless you have a dedicated vagus nerve stimulation device or you have a clinic that is able to test it out. Um, I actually had to build a special device for my clinic, so not um, not ideal. There are implantable devices. This is usually for people in chronic pain or chronic um, vagus nerve issues, and these are surgically implanted. They wrap electrodes actually around the vagus nerve, and they usually implant them. Um, they're usually implanted in your chest, or sometimes you, you wear a belt clip so you can recharge the batteries. In my experience with the patients I've seen, they are more trouble than they are worth. They get infected, they don't work, they cause more pain than they solve. Um, so if, if I have a patient that is trying to decide to get one, I always try and convince them into another device first um, because the risks are a lot lower when you're not putting something implanted in your body. Every patient I've had get one has it removed within five years. So strongly consider your options before implanting one, right? That's a conversation with you and your surgeon and your pain doctor, um, but that's my two cents on it, okay? Cold exposure, cryotherapy, you see these big nitrogen tanks or um, um, the ice bucket challenge that went around a couple years ago, the polar plunge. Um, this is big in Norwegian culture or Scandinavian culture, I should say. You go into a sauna and roast yourself alive and then you jump in the cold lake, cold exposure therapy, okay? Um, yeah, we covered all of that. Okay, so what do some of these things look like? Transcutaneous vagus nerve stimulation. That's what the T stands for. There's a couple of ways to do this. Transcutaneous, direct through the skin, or tragal, specifically meaning through the ear. Um, if you start digging into the medical literature on this, some people say you have to use the tragus. Other people say you have to use the concha. And I'm pretty sure I have a slide about this later. I've used all of the above and it all seems to work. I haven't noticed anything different in my patient population. I have a small sample size. So I'm, I'm purely going on my observations. I don't have hard numbers to back this up, okay? 
couple of devices. This is my favorite device for home use. It's called a Gamma Core. Uh, it's a company out of the UK called Electro Core. And they've got these electrodes. You use some ultrasound gel and you actually jam it right up. If you can see my face here under your chin and you get the other one right on kind of the fleshy spot between your windpipe and the, the sternocleidomastoid, this big muscle on the side of your neck. And you turn it up until you actually get your face to, to quiver a little bit. You let it sit for two minutes, it's going to shut itself off and you do the whole thing again and you get fantastic vagus nerve stimulation through this. Okay, so we're getting a little more of the motor branch at that point. Um, along with the sensory portion, when you do it in the ear, you're looking at mostly just the sensory portion of the nerve. Um, so this will work a little bit better for stimulating top down instead of bottom up. Okay. This device is great, and we use these in the clinic for a long time. I still have one um, compared to the next device I'm going to show you, which is the exact same thing. These are available through the company or through clinics like mine. We can help you order one. Okay, They run on a, a subscription program, so you, you pay the, the company monthly to use it, um, all sorts of stuff like that. I use this in the clinic because of the stainless steel electrodes. I can clean it off and bounce from patient to patient to patient. Okay. We have cleanliness issues to deal with here. This one is called a Hoolist, named after the guy that invented it. His name is Aaron Hool. He's a PhD out of MIT, I think. Very similar uh, device here. These are actually gel type electrodes, so I can't put it on my neck. I can't then jump to Carly's neck because I can't clean those electrodes real well. Okay, And the electrodes aren't expensive. Um, they're like six bucks a pair. But if I'm seeing 12 people a day, I've just burned through a hundred bucks in electrodes. That's not, um, that's not so usable. So the, the stainless steel works way better for me. And they make two devices. This one is about the size of, a, of an AirPod container, your little headphones, and it's made to travel with you. You keep it in your pocket, you keep it in your purse, whatever. Um, and they're great for that. So if you're out and about, you're getting a little overstimulated, you can pull it out and you can stimulate that, that vagus nerve. And they actually also use that sensory branch. This one's called a Prime. It's a little more powerful. In my opinion, it works better, but it also costs a little bit more. Okay. Again, um, we have these on our website. If it's something you want and you want to talk about it, great. Um, talk to me, talk to the company. They're fantastic. Uh, not obligated at all. In fact, I don't think I linked anything in here either. Um, but those are the two, two bigger devices. And then this is my ear slide that I should have had on there earlier when I was talking about ear clips. Each color represents a location to hook up two clips. So one on the tragus, one on the earlobe, or you can do them on the concha, simba concha, or you can do one back in the concha and one on the tragus. I've tried all of these combinations with ear clips. They all seem to work just as well as another. It honestly comes down to um, patient preference. The clips I have are pretty small, but if I've got a 10 year old, I'm not going to get that clip in their ear. It's just not big enough. So I will usually end up sticking one um, up in the conjure here and lower, or I'll do here and down on the earlobe. And again, this isn't something you should really feel when you're running, running that through there. Um, if you overstimulate someone with a vagus nerve, you'll end up giving them a headache, which is kind of the opposite of what you're, what you're after. Um, but again, this is probably not something you'd be doing at home at home. Um, Devices like this or this are really the your best options, the safest options, um, because they're designed for consumer use. You don't need me holding the device for you. That's something you can do on your own. Okay. Um, so that's all different ways to do vagus nerve stimulation that involves equipment. So how do you do things at home that don't involve equipment, right? This is the free stuff. Okay. A couple of these are safe. I will we'll talk about with gargling. If you have a swallowing problem, gargling is not the exercise for you. We do not need you aspirating. Okay, you can gargle with water, so it's uh, it's a you know not a, a sweet liquid. You're not going to aspirate something that's going to cause you to grow mold in your lungs or something like that. But if you have a swallowing issue, do not gargle. It's just not going to be safe for you. Okay, but things like breathing and meditation. You can look something up on YouTube that's a guided meditation. If you already have a meditation practice, um, if you look at cultures across the world, um, we have drum circles, we have rhythmic dancing, we have, um, I grew up Catholic, so what do you do? You, you walk into the church before mass and then everybody's saying the rosary and the whole building's vibrating. All of this stuff 
is stimulating to the vagus nerve because you're getting into that repetitive, um, activating that voice, the, the throat, you're activating the diaphragm, you're breathing, all of that stuff is stimulating to the vagus nerve, okay? If you already have a practice like that, it's great. Along with vagus nerve stimulation through an electronic means or a laser means, everyone in our office gets breathing exercises. I don't care if you sprained your wrist, you're getting a breathing exercise because it dampens inflammation. And none of us breathe very well anyway, so I take it upon, we take it upon ourselves to teach people how to breathe again, okay? Yoga is fantastic because it's intentional movement. It forces you to move and control your body while working through breathing exercises, okay? So if breathing and meditation is too boring for you, get into Tai Chi, get into yoga, get into um, Pilates. All of these things force you to work on your core, work on your breathing mechanics while keeping your mind focused on a task and concentrating, right? That's really kind of what we're after here. Humming, singing, yelling, activating those vocal cords. Remember the larynx and the pharynx are innervated by vagus nerve. So activating those things will send information back up the brain. Likewise, we have to send information down that nerve, thereby activating the parts of the brain involved with vagus nerve, okay? Exercise, moderate intensity. Mm, I forgot what that actually means, but I believe it is about 30 minutes, five days a week at something like 60 to 70 percent of your maximum heart rate which you can google how to calculate that um, i'm a little rusty on that i wrote this presentation a while ago so forgive me for not knowing that that statistic off the top of my head and then we get to cold exposure this comes back up because you don't need a cryo tank to do it um, this is the kind of the the sauna thing we talked about earlier you go in the sauna you jump in a cold shower you go in the sauna you jump in the lake or um well, you guys are you're all up by me if you go do snow angels out in the snow same sort of thing um this is splashing cold water on your face cold shower doesn't need to be frigid right it just needs to be a little bit uncomfortable right you shouldn't feel like somebody's stabbing you with an ice pick standing under the shower and it doesn't take very long 30 seconds at lukewarm just enough to make it where you're you're not super comfortable standing there um and not panicking about it. You don't want to don't want to feel like you're panicking because of the cold water. It kind of defeats the purpose. Okay. Um, but those are the really the easiest ways to do this at home. And the way we do this in the office is we will take someone through the rehab protocol for the day, whatever we're having them do. That takes about a half hour to 40 minutes, and then we'll put them on a laser and um, some kind of electronic vagus nerve stimulation with breathing exercises for about 15 minutes. Um, so that's really what you're after. So go about doing your exercises, whatever kind of rehab program you're in, whether that's self-imposed or guided with a healthcare provider, and then add in some vagus nerve stimulation. If you're not sure if it's working, go down to Walgreens and pick up a cheap uh, pulse oximeter. They're like 50 bucks. And as you're doing some of this stuff, you should actually see your heart rate start to come down. And that's a good indicator that you're getting good activation of the vagus nerve. Um, the flip side is if your heart rate is kind of hanging out and it starts to come down and then all of a sudden it spikes, that means you're fatiguing that system and it's probably time to take a little bit of a break. So if you're doing your exercises, whatever you're doing, and your heart rate is hanging out about 90, you start doing some breathing exercises and some meditation, and the heart rate drops down to 70, you're getting nice and relaxed, and all of a sudden it spikes to 110, 120 beats. Stop intentionally meditating, uh, meditating and, and trying to activate that vagus nerve because we can't overclock the system. And that's really what that looks like. Um, sorry, I don't have a, a better way to guide you on that, but the, you know, that's why we start inviting people into our office um, at that point if they're, if they're struggling with this sort of stuff. But Really what we're after is kind of that Zen, getting that calming aspect of that parasympathetic nervous system so that you can get to a place that you can heal. If you're not in a parasympathetic state, the brain is essentially panicking and it's really hard to move forward at that point. Our immune system is overactivated. Our brain is overfiring. We need to slow that stuff down so that we can get, um, get into a place where our brain is ready to heal, ready to rehab, so that when you're doing all of the right things with all of the right providers, you're actually seeing the benefit of it rather than essentially going through the motions and pushing yourself too hard, okay? Um, that was a lot of information really fast. So 
if you have questions now i i think would be the time i'm assuming we have time for Absolutely, that um, do, otherwise yeah. if you're shy and don't want to ask them on on the call here that's that's our information um you can text us at the clinic or you can email me directly and we can we can try and help you out so um yes i yeah. don't kind of have any questions that they want to ask now you can you can type in the chat and i can read it too or um it's all so very interesting. Looks like Barbara's trying to ask a question. Yeah, hi, Barbara. <laughs> Hello, Carly. Thank you so much. That was so great. Um, Thank you. I'm a physical therapist, and I work at a community healing center. Perfect. And we have been um, working with Stephen Porges's polyvagal theory since, I don't know, about 2016. So one of the modalities that we use is the safe and sound protocol, which is a listening protocol. And I'm just curious if you if you have done some of that study with Stephen Porges at all. I have not, um, but I'm Googling it as we speak, and that's going to make it on my reading list for later this week. Yeah, yeah. When we first heard about it, it was completely um, very difficult to understand. Uh, the person I, th I would say in the polyvagal world that is makes things easier to understand is Deb Dana. And she's kind of more the clinical person. Um, but it's amazing. I mean, we've had some very good, good results with anxiety and depression, um, doing this safe and sound protocol. And yeah. since it started, there have been so many clinicians around the world that have been continually giving feedback to Dr. Porges. So the protocol over the years has changed quite significantly. Um, yeah, and that's, that's kind of the key is if a protocol never changes, then you kind of have to, your red flags go up. But if they're willing to change protocols, that's great. How do you, yeah. spell, um, how do you spell Porges? Um, P-O-R-G-E-S. And Stephen is S-T-E-P-H-E-N. He lives in um, Florida. Perfect. I think Atlantic City. Well, there you go. I didn't count on learning anything today, but well, you good. will be very interested in this. Yes. Awesome. I appreciate it. So if it. anybody has an interest in the Safe and Sound Protocol and what we're doing at Heart Springs, please contact Jan Nelson and and yes, and Aaron Fargo, just for those of you that yeah, other yeah, yes, yes, great. Well, thank, awesome. thank you for thank the you. presentation. That was great. That was. There was one question in the chat. Does insurance reimburse for these procedures in the office setting? That is a great question. Um, my office specifically is uh, out of network provider. Um, so we don't submit uh, ourselves, but everything we do, again, because I'm a chiropractor by primary training, this shows up as a attended electrical stimulation code, which is more than uh, insurance reimbursable. So at that point, it really comes down to the insurance game. Are they going to cover it or not? But it is a reimbursable code, right? Um, Barbara's nodding over there too, because we all we all know the game. Just because we do it and it's reimbursable doesn't mean your insurance company is going to reimburse it, um, which is always very, very frustrating. And that's why I like some of those home devices. Um, the black one I had on the screen, the small one is 200 bucks, right? So it's very, very affordable. Um, the bigger one, I think, comes in at 400 or 450 or something like that. It is more powerful and does a better job, but it doesn't travel as well. So uh, you kind of have to play with that. The Gamma Core um, downs on a subscription base, so it ends up being a little bit more expensive. In my experience, it is the best home device, but it also, they know it and they, they charge for it too. But um, if you have something like migraines associated with your um with whatever you have going on that gamma core is fantastic people swear by it and if you're not getting migraines subscription fees are pretty well worth it so um there's there's big components of that so kind of a roundabout answer yes this stuff is reimbursable in the office laser therapy is technically reimbursable stim is reimbursable rehab is reimbursable chiropractic adjustments are reimbursable reimbursable but they don't always get reimbursed which is which is very frustrating for just as frustrating for me as the provider and you as the patient. So we are in that frustration together, believe me. Yes, we hear that. <laughs> yes. Anyone else have any other questions? I don't 
think I see any, so I will let you. Oh, does your treatment look? What did your treatment look like for migraines in the office? Sure. Um, migraines are actually, most of our protocols are very similar regardless of condition because we're looking at uh, your brain's ability to interpret where your body is in space. Okay. So there's a lot of eye movements involved. There's a lot of balance training. We get into vestibular systems for almost everything, whether it be a concussion, a stroke rehab. Um, I just discharged a really fun seizure case. I realize that sounds sadistic, but um, that was a really fun case for me because I don't treat a lot of seizures. Um, so it was different. Um, so the rehab aspect will look very, very similar. Migraines are unique in that there's almost always a metabolic component, whether it be um, typically in women, there's a hormone metabolism issue. Um, there's usually some variety of anemia issue, whether that be iron or B vitamins or use or what have you, um, inflammation. So at that point, I start to look at a lot of blood work or um, lifestyle. Do you have chemicals in your environment? Do you have sensitivities to foods? Are you metabolizing your, your hormones appropriately? So we really start to look at, um, if you remember my little triangle, that fuel aspect of things a lot more in migraines than I do say in an acute concussion injury, right? I say concussion because that's what we treat most of. Um, as these things get more chronic in the concussion world, then we'll start to look at lab work as well. Um, but uh, it involves, taking a tour through your brain, checking out all the different regions of the brain, figuring out which ones aren't communicating well, which ones I can make fail in the office, and then can I make a change? Am I the right guy to do rehab with you? Um, and then a lot of times there's a blood panel to look and see how are those metabolic systems working? Or if you have energy problems, we can run like an organic acid test. Are you producing your energy appropriately? Are you any number of things that way? So really it's a two pronged approach, looking at the metabolism and lifestyle type influences on those migraines, as well as a neurological component. And we find the people that want to do just one or the other don't tend to do so well, right? You've had people see functional medicine providers. You've had people go through a, a gamut of chiropractic, physical therapy, medical care, and they've got great care. Everybody did the right stuff, but when you're not doing them together, sometimes, um, sometimes they're, you know, you did all the best rehab in the world, but if you're anemic, it's not going to matter. So we really have to track down both of those, those avenues. Um, and uh, a lot of the ways we look at the, the lab work is I'm not necessarily concerned with if you have overt pathology, I want to look and see how far away from perfect are you? Because if you're symptomatic and your, your iron is just a little bit low, I'm going to pay attention to that, even though it's maybe not lab low. I keep picking on iron because it's an easy one to understand. Um, but we do that with all of our all of our lab markers. Um, so that's kind of what that looks like. And um, I'm assuming since I'm talking to the North Dakota Brain Injury Network, most of you are uh, not in my metro area. Um, and in that case, what we end up doing is we do essentially intensive protocol where we have you down to the office and we run through a whole bunch of rehab really fast. Uh, multiple appointments a day over the course of a, a week to really get you a jump start. We send you home with homework and then we check up on you to make sure that you're doing your homework, you're not sliding backwards instead of having you drive in for an hour long appointment once a week over the course of eight weeks that that racks up the miles real fast and it's not super useful. Um, in that situation, if you live next to me great come on in once a week and we'll send you home with homework, but. Um, Otherwise, we find you somebody closer and we, we try and support as we can or, or what have you. I'm sorry, I don't know why my camera, apparently it thinks I'm ugly today. <laughs> no, all good. Thank you for explaining that. Uh, anyone else have questions? I have kind of a, I don't know how to word my question, but in the beginning, Wait, it's kind of two. You do, you said you did uh, chiropractic care in the beginning. Yep. And then I see, I, I, my question is, how does the adjustment, neck adjustments affect the vagus nerve? Sure. Um, you see, I, I, go to, I, oh, I go to the chiropractor quite regular because sure. of my degenerative disc disorders. Sure. My neck is the first thing that he has to work on. Yeah. So we tend to approach 
all of our patients in the same way in that I'm looking at everything I do to you and how it stimulates your brain. So I do significantly less adjustments than most people are used to when they come to a chiropractor. Okay. And the only reason I say that is adjustments are very powerful inputs into the brain, especially in, in the neck, right? You have a lot of ranges of motion in your neck. We're very dependent on where our head is in space to know how to orient our body and know where we are. And so when we're looking at doing an adjustment, whether it be in the thoracic spine, the lumbar spine, the tip of your little finger or in the neck, I have to be concerned with what's happening to the brain. I'm stretching muscles on one side, I'm compressing joints on the other, I'm getting varying uh, degrees of motion through Golgi tendon organs, I'm stimulating muscle fibers. Some of these things are stimulatory to the brain, some of them are inhibitory, some of them, um, all of it ends up in our vestibular system to tell us where we are. And particularly in a cervical spine, because we're so reliant on that information, um, I'm very cautious about it because we can overstimulate the brain. We can cause too much movement and so we don't know where we are in space anymore. And so that's where that pulse oximeter can come in very, very helpful because I can see what happens to your heart rate immediately after I do something. If I'm doing something and that heart rate is coming down, that's usually a good thing. We're stimulating vagus nerve, we're having good appropriate reaction. If I do something to you, whether that be put a laser on your head or give you a balance exercise, um, have you do some complex movements with your hand or do an adjustment and that heart rate goes way up, adjustments can be a little unnerving. They can be scary. It's very quick movements. So we'll see that heart rate go up initially, but I want to see that heart rate come back to normal and recover. If that doesn't happen, then we know we overstimulated something and that's how I gauge it. Um, other things we can do is look at heart rate variability and make sure that's um, becoming a, a healthier marker, uh, which means it becomes more variable. Okay, A lot of people think that variability is a bad thing. We want our heart rate very quite variable. Um, but how you would relate an adjustment specifically to vagus nerve stimulation, most of the information that comes from our muscles and joints is going to end up in our vestibular system, not just the move, uh, information about spinning or moving. We send all of our muscular information through that vestibular system as well to know where we are. That vestibular system sends it to our cerebellum and our cerebellum, the part of the brain that coordinates everything, sends a lot of that information to things like our mesencephalon, our midbrain, which ramps up our sympathetic nervous system. So we're actually coming through it through a side door rather than going direct to the vagus nerve, direct to the parasympathetic system. We're actually dampening its opposite. We're dampening that sympathetic nervous system. So that's how we can relate adjustments back to it. Um, but it's a double-edged sword because any stimulation that is good, too much of it can become a bad thing as well. I realize that is not a straightforward answer to the question you ask, but it's it's not exactly uh, linear black and white. So um, adjustments can be very good. Adjustments can actually also be very damaging. We can overstimulate someone very, very quickly. Um, so by the time people have made it to my office, they usually have a chiropractor, a physical therapist, an acupuncture, a naturopath, and they've seen everybody and if they've made it to me, they're a little bit on the fragile side. They've been adjusted and it's a great supporting therapy, but it's usually not the first place I go um, because it's usually a little bit too much. Does that answer your question? I'm sorry, that was a, a lot of talking in circles. <laughs> yeah, it did. It went kind of fast, but I did. Yeah, it's quite complex. Now, my yeah. other question was, those, what are those two black instruments you said that went for $200? What are those for? Those are... Everybody watch your eyes. We're going to back up a little bit. Um, so these are called Hulist. This one's called a Hulist Prime, and this one's called a Hulist Mini. And they are vagus nerve stimulation devices. Okay, so they've got these little electrodes here. They're little silicone things. Um, and you put them up on, actually, yeah. right up behind your ear here, and you get the sensory branch of this auricular branch of the vagus nerve. And they send little electrical impulses into that nerve and that fires right down into your brain stem and essentially activates that vagus nerve to slow everything down okay that's it in a nutshell and these this device in particular the small one is made to fit in your little key pocket in your jeans or in your purse or in you know wherever and to be at a, a nice low price point you know 200 bucks most people can scrape that together and um, it's a great tool for home use. 
it's not strong enough to hurt you with, which I like. Um, some of the devices I've had in the past, I used to use a, an actual medical peripheral nerve stimulator, but you can really zap yourself with one of those. So I don't like sending patients home with it. These aren't so strong. So they're, they're designed for consumer use. Um, and it's really, really difficult to hurt yourself with one, but that's what they're there for. So they stimulate vagus nerve from the outside, um, outside in. Does that help you out, Skip? I was going to say they're nothing like the uh, TENS units, huh? They are actually very similar to TENS units. So a TENS unit, instead of having these little electrodes, they come with cables, right? Uh -huh. Just like these. And what I've done with my STEM device here is I've put ear clips on it. Otherwise, you can use those little sticky pads, and that would be just like a TENS unit. And you can use those as well. Um, but I don't like to because if something goes wrong, now you have to peel them off your neck. Um, so I really like devices like this, that there's nothing glued to you. You just, if something goes wrong, you pull it off and it's totally fine. Oh, okay. Cause those tens units I put down like right below the, oh, at the top of the spine there, right below the ear. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. And that, that does, that does work. There is a significant amount of research about that. I don't use that for my patients at home, um, because a lot of times it takes a partner to get those pads in there. If you turn the TENS unit up too much, you can spasm some muscles. Yeah. Um, it's easy to forget <laughs> you have a TENS unit on. Those devices, excuse me, they all shut off. So it's easy to time out your therapy. Um, so you can get very good results with a TENS unit. Um, I have patients that do that, but I don't recommend it to patients because it's just safer to use a dedicated vagus nerve stim device. How often would you suggest using that uh, vagus nerve thing? We have people run through their protocols three times a day, um, oh. sometimes more, sometimes less. But vagus nerve stimulation, um, especially those little black devices, what's nice about those is you can essentially do it as much as you need to anytime you end up getting quote unquote triggered. Um, but I like to see at least probably once a day, if not three times. Um, but like myself now, I'm over caffeinated and, and all hyped up. I would like to run some vagus nerve stimulation on myself um, at the moment. So. Thank you. Very interesting stuff. Welcome. Thank you. Good questions. I see a lot of nodding coming from Barbara, so she must be in agreement of what I'm saying. You're the only one, aside from Carly, you're the only one with the camera on. So right. that's what I'm Yeah, thinking. the shy crew today. <laughs> very good. Yeah, very good info. Good question, Skip. Yeah, Skip's always talked about how much the chiropractor helps her. She's way out on the western side of the state. So oh, yeah. has limited um, access to different things. Yes. But she does the best. Way over, way over here in the prairie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're almost in Montana there. <laughs> so, yeah. Good to hear your voice, though, Skip. <laughs> um, thank you. Nice to see everybody and hear everybody again. Yeah. I missed the missed talk last time, but um, this is, well, what you shared, Doctor, is very, there's a lot there. I'm very helpful yeah, and interested. Uh, it's one of those things where, you can dig as deep as you want on it, but at the end of the day, vagus nerve stimulation helps rehab, and that's really what you need to know. Um, and it's very easy to do at home without equipment, and that's that's kind of the, the the real takeaway is this is not something that's really expensive to get into. You can you can spend as much money on it as you want. Those lasers are, like I said, they cost as much as a car, but you certainly don't need a laser to get good vagus nerve stimulation. Yeah. Could you? Uh, my question is, could you? Explain how does the vagus nerve actually get uh, hit or injured? Um, the vagus nerve, because it's traveling through and it becomes superficial in the neck, if you have uh, some kind of traumatic injury or um, even something like a, a dissection in the neck of a carotid or a jugular or something like that, those blood products can be very damaging to things, although probably probably not so much to the nerve just re because of the, the limited contact it would have. Um, but if you have crush injuries to the, to the brain, to the, to the 
to the skull, you could maybe damage it coming out, but more often you're going to see problems in the actual brain stem where the nerve comes from is more likely where you're going to see the injury. So if you had a brain stem stroke, for example, um, and the medulla and the nucleus solitarius and uh, nucleus ambiguous, and all of the stuff associated with the vagus nerve, if that stuff gets damaged because of a vascular injury, that's more likely where you're going to see that. Um, but the actual vagus nerve getting damaged is probably a little bit more unlikely. And that's why I said it's it's almost more important to figure out what your brain is doing with that information rather than is the nerve itself conducting, right? Because if the nerve is there, vagus nerve is very, very deep. It runs out of a couple of holes in the bottom of your skull. It's very deep next to the arteries in your neck. And then it dives really, really deep into your abdomen and stays very, very central before it gets out into your intestines. Um, so it's really, really well protected and buried because it's so crucial to our survival. Um, so the nerve itself getting damaged is, is fairly unlikely. Uh, but the brainstem is a, is a different story. Even in, um, I'm not belittling concussions, but even in a mild dramatic brain injury where the brain isn't penetrated, the skull isn't crushed, the brain bounces around in the skull and we get this ringing effect where the, think of it like wringing out a washcloth or a rag or something like that. We get this compression from a central aspect of the brainstem. So even in that aspect, we can start to see some consequences or some problems with vagus nerve because the brainstem is suffering from even that quote unquote mild trauma, right? So oh, that's uh, easily, oh, so it's easily damaged then. Well, I mean, not damaged, but it's easily injured from a lot of yes, easily, directions. Easily involved in almost any variety of brain injury is, is, is oh. a good way to put it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. I hate to cut it short. I that's do need okay. to run. Yes. If Thank anybody you has so much questions, for your time. Carly has my information. Otherwise, it's up on the screen there. And um, I'll be back sometime later this summer. I think we have one more in the fall. So Yes, you will. I am yes. always reachable. We love hearing from you. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time. All right. Thank everybody you so for much. Coming. Yep. Have a good day, everybody. You too.